I interviewed a number of justices for my recent book, and one of those justices, well, since the interview was off the record, let's call him, uh, for those of you who lived through the Harry Potter books, as I did with my children, he who must not be named. <laughs> During the interview, in which we had been talking about the current court, the Roberts Court, this justice spontaneously said he didn't know why Supreme Courts were named after their chief justices. For example, the Warren Court, the Rehnquist Court, the Berger Court, and now the Roberts Court. He said, why should Chief Justice Rehnquist be blamed for what that court did? <laughs> Instead, he suggested the Supreme Court should be named after the president who named the last justice to the court. Now that would make this Supreme Court not the Roberts Court, but the Obama Court. And somehow, I think, even after a few surprising victories, labeling this court the Obama Court would be a big surprise for this president. <laughs> but after I listened to him talk, I gave this some thought. And I thought, in counterpoint to what he who must not be named said, that if instead of the current Chief Justice's name, Perhaps there was another more appropriate name for the court. And voila, it came to me. Of course, the Supreme Court should be named after someone who has devoted a major portion of his career writing and teaching about the Supreme Court, that very closely held institution. And so who better than Henry Abraham? <laughs> <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so I asked my very wonderfully talented friend and colleague, Art Lean, who is one of a disappearing breed of courtroom artists, he draws the Supreme Court for NBC News, to memorialize the Abraham Court. <laughs> and so, Henry, Art did a wonderful sketch, which I hope I get out here. I asked him to draw the court with all of the chief justices who sat on the court from the time you were born, with you in the middle. Sure, Henry will show it to you afterwards. Thank goodness for Wikipedia. Art and I sat and we uh, called up, up the names of all the uh, chief justices from uh, 19, <clears throat> we won't say when, and uh, they actually had photographs and Art was able to sketch from those some of those very old fo photographs uh, the pictures of each chief justice and nicely there were eight so that we could put Henry in the middle <laughs> as the ninth. <laughs> Seriously, though, I've come here in a sense to tell you a story about the current court. And yet, I can't tell you the end to this particular story because every Supreme Court term is a story in itself. It has its own multiple plots, unknown outcomes, and sometimes not even the same characters, which makes it challenging and very exciting for a reporter or journalist to write about. What I can say definitely is that this is an amazing time in the life of the Roberts Court. During just the last three years, the court has been taking and deciding some of the most important and controversial questions facing society. The 2011-12 term was all about what we would call structural issues in the Constitution. Did Congress have the power under the Commerce Clause or the Tax and Spend Clause to require you and me to buy health insurance? Could Congress, consistent with the Constitution, impose certain conditions on the states to achieve an expansion 
of the federal state Medicaid program? And could Arizona or other states have immigration enforcement laws that were parallel or inconsistent with federal immigration laws? One term later, the emphasis changed. It shifted from structural issues over who has the power to do what under the Constitution to equality issues. Was there still a need to consider race in university admissions policies? Could states, consistent with the 14th Amendment, ban same-sex marriages? Could Congress, consistent with the Equal Protection Guarantee in the Fifth Amendment, define marriage as the union between a man and a woman for all federal purposes? Was the Voting Rights Act, the crown jewel of the civil rights movement, out of date in its, in its approach to voting discrimination in an America that, said the Chief Justice, has changed? And this term is the Lollapalooza of the prior two in the number of culture war issues come home to roost. Consider the following. On New Year's Eve 2013, as revelers gathered to close out the old year, and Justice Sonia Sotomayor prepared to lower the ball in New York City, the state of Utah filed an emergency request in the U.S. Supreme Court. The state asked Justice Sotomayor or the full court to block temporarily a federal judge's decision striking down Utah's ban on same-sex marriages until a federal appeals court ruled. At roughly the same time, in fact within days, an order of Catholic nuns who care for the elderly sick also sought an emergency injunction from Justice Sotomayor or the full court. The nuns wanted to stop a requirement in the federal health care law, the Affordable Care Act, from applying to their employee insurance plan the requirement they believed mandated coverage of contraceptives and the nuns objected on religious grounds. By the time those appeals had reached the court, the justices already had agreed to step into issues prior courts had wrestled with decades ago and some more recently, including challenges involving buffer zones around abortion clinics. Remember the case Hill versus Colorado 14 years ago took up a similar issue. Prayer before government meetings. We see the return of Marsh v. Chambers decided in 1983. Limits on individual campaign contributions. Back again, Buckley versus Vallejo from 1976. Another affirmative action case, this time a ban on affirmative action. From the same state, a new twist on Grutter versus Bollinger decided more than a decade ago. And once again, a major but new structural question, a test of presidential versus congressional power in the form of the president's recess appointments power. And in nearly every one of those cases, notably, either the conservative challengers or their supporters who brought the case aggressively have asked the justices to overrule prior decisions in those areas, some decisions nearly 100 years old. Finally, as we saw just last week, the health care law is back on the decision docket. This time, though, it's a narrower, but still significant challenge by for-profit corporations and their owners who claim that providing contraceptive coverage in their employee health policies violates their own and their corporation's exercise of religion. Last summer, Justice Anthony Kennedy was quoted during a lecture as saying, a democracy should not be dependent for its major decisions on what nine unelected people from a narrow legal background have to say. But that appears to be the situation increasingly. And since those major decisions, more often than not today, divide the justices along ideological lines, 
It may not simply be nine unelected people making the decisions so much as one critical to the counting of five majority votes, ironically, Justice Kennedy himself. What we call cause litigation has been around for many decades. In the 50s and the 60s, the civil rights movement used the courts as well as the legislative branch to achieve their goals. Thurgood Marshall, the lawyer, expertly strategized the path to Brown versus Board of Education through the courts. With the birth of the conservative legal movement in the 70s, it's not surprising to see conservative cause litigation taking a page from Marshall's and the Civil Rights Playbook in their own march to change the law. Lawyers behind the Second Amendment gun case in 2008 and the voting rights challenge decided last term bluntly told me they were following Marshall's strategy to get to the Supreme Court. And with a conservative dominated Supreme Court, it also is not surprising that this conservative libertarian movement is pushing hard today in so many areas as the present term shows. This fall, the Roberts Court begins its fifth year. Your own Professor Dick Howard at the University of Virginia School of Law has said that it takes about nine years for a court's profile to emerge. Sometimes, though, I think it's important to take a step back and remember that the Roberts Court is still a young court in one sense. Before John Roberts took his seat in September of 2005, the court's membership had not changed in 11 years, 11 years, the longest period without change in modern times. But then in the next five years, three new justices joined Roberts on the nine member bench. So roughly half of the court turned over in just those five years. In my book, I, uh, I asked that when I was interviewing justices what impact that has on the court, the turnover, and some of them described for me how it felt. One justice said, it's going to be different. You develop not only a relationship with the court, but individual relationships as well. I miss David Souter very much. Like anything else, you suddenly get a new member of the family and you try to get to know them, to establish a relationship with them, how they like to deal with their colleagues, be it a close personal relationship or to maintain a more distant one. It adds a new element and then you do it again a year later. It reshuffles the deck. Another justice boiled it down to very, in very practical terms. This justice said, old alliances people you could rely on for certain positions in prior cases aren't there anymore. I think Justice Scalia surely felt that keenly when Justices Stevens and Souter, who supported his five vote majority in Justice Scalia's revolution in the confrontation clause, retired from the court. Justice Kennedy, who vehemently disagrees with Justice Scalia in this area of the law, is always looking for opportunities to test those rulings, according to former clerks. And Justice Scalia is just as vehemently trying to keep those cases away from Justice Kennedy. Justice Kagan also described how difficult it can be to join a court where most of its members have been engaging in certain ongoing conversations about the law for more than a decade. The new justice must try to pick up the thread of those conversations, a little bit like starting in the middle of war and peace. <laughs> and of course, a new justice may tip the balance in a certain area of the law in a different direction. We saw that occur in campaign finance law with the very controversial Citizens United decision. When she sat on the court, Justice O'Connor supported limits on money in elections. 
When Justice Alito succeeded her, he tipped a 5-4 balance that had been in favor of those limits against limits on corporate and union spending in federal elections. What we can say about the Roberts Court, almost since its very beginning, is that this conservative majority is a very confident majority, unafraid to deliver jolts to the legal system, as with its Second Amendment gun ruling, its Citizens United campaign finance decision, and its voting rights ruling last term, and it's unafraid to act in not so conservative ways by overturning older decisions, some not so old, and refusing to defer to elected officials who are closest and accountable to the people. It's also a majority certain of its ability and authority to decide some of the country's most contested issues. There really was no compelling need for the court in 2006 to grant review of the constitutionality of so-called race tiebreakers used to maintain diversity in the Louisville and Seattle public schools. There was no conflict in the lower courts to resolve. The use of race was a minor factor in the assignment of students. There was virtually no controversy among the parents in the districts. And the districts were proud of what they had accomplished and committed to maintaining that progress. The justices had even turned away a nearly identical case from Massachusetts just months earlier when Justice O'Connor was on the court. But for the Louisville Seattle grant of review, Justice O'Connor was gone, succeeded by Justice Samuel Alito. And did the court really need or have to step into the long simmering debate, primarily within academic circles, but not in the lower courts, over the meaning of the Second Amendment? Of course, the mayor of the District of Columbia wanted to revive the city's gun law after it was struck down by a federal court of appeals. But what would have been the cost of staying out of that legal fight? The city council would have returned to the drawing board to draft a new regulation that might have complied with the appellate court decision, as well as might have met its own concerns about gun violence in the city. More evidence of this confident majority comes in the campaign finance decisions. After Justice O'Connor left the court, the Roberts Court moved slowly at first, and then very quickly with 5-4 decisions towards eliminating federal restrictions on money in elections. Justice O'Connor, by the way, was the only justice in years to have served on the court who actually had stood for election and knew how campaigns worked and how money in campaigns worked. With its ruling in Citizens United and this week's McCutcheon decision, the court has loosened the reins considerably on spending and contributions in federal elections. During the McCutcheon arguments last fall, I was surprised by how skeptical and quite certain the Chief Justice and Justices Alito and Scalia were that there was no basis in reality for the scenarios offered by the Solicitor General of the United States as to what could happen if the court struck down the law's cap on the total amount of individual contributions to candidates. And after those arguments, a campaign finance expert who works for a nonpartisan research organization wrote a column about what he thought were erroneous assumptions made by some justices during the arguments, and he wondered if they would form the basis of, those deci of the decision. The decision did indeed reflect a number of those assumptions, even though the justices had no record before them of how the cap actually worked on the ground, because no lower court, as is usually the case, had held full hearings, taken testimony, from Congress, members of Congress and experts on how the caps worked or what the impact would be if the caps were gone. The decisions in the campaign finance arena as well as in the voting rights area 
also reflect uh, what is considered a, a, an unconservative way of proceeding, and that's the lack of deference to, and at times, open disdain for Congress. Now, I know Congress is an easy target these days for all of us, but the members held hearings and made findings, took a lot of time, developed thousands of pages in their records to support the regulations and laws that the majority struck down in those two areas. This is not to say that the court's decisions were wrong, but it just shows that they have the confidence and the willingness to use the power that being the final court of resort gives them. And of course, the court doesn't always have a choice about which cases to take. Because of the conflict in the lower appellate courts and the issue's national importance, the court had to review the first major challenge to the health care law. I like to think I had uh, great foresight in choosing the cases that I did for my book, but I think I was lucky in the sense that although they are all landmark decisions of the Roberts Court, the issues that they raise live on. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about why I chose the cases that I did. As Barbara pointed out, the four are the challenge to the Seattle and Louisville public schools use of race and student assignments, the Second Amendment challenge to the District of Columbia's very restrictive gun law, Citizens United's campaign finance challenge, and the challenge to the new federal health care law. I picked the cases for four reasons. I wanted signature or landmark decisions, decisions that likely had a shelf life, perhaps spawning future litigation. I wanted 5-4 decisions, not to show the court as always ideologically divided, because they are not. Even though the media, myself included, we focus on the 5-4 cases, the headline cases, you might be surprised to know that in more than 50, 60 percent of the court's decisions each term are either unanimous or 8-1 or 7-2. There is a lot of consensus across this ideologically divided bench. But the 5-4 decisions also tell us, I think, the most about how the justices, individual justices, approach interpreting laws and the Constitution. And there are differences. The justices on the left and the justices on the right are not monolithic blocks. <laughs> Justice Scalia is not the same kind of conservative as Justice, uh, Chief Justice Roberts. Justice Breyer is not the same kind of liberal as Justice Ginsburg. I also sought decisions with interesting backstories, compelling stories because I wanted to tell how these cases got to the Supreme Court. Again, we often in the media just lay it out, this case is at the Supreme Court, the court will hear the case, arguments in October, decision by July, decision comes, boom. It's like the case arrives on the doorstep, fully grown. But that's not the case. And finally, I wanted cases uh, that told stories that people would care about and want to learn more about. The health care case was added late in the book process, and my only regret is there was not more time between the decision and my deadline to examine more what happened inside the court. The justices and their former clerks seem to find it a little bit easier to talk about cases when time has eased the controversy, and health care was a big controversy. So you will meet in my book a Seattle mother, Kathleen Bros, whose unsuccessful effort to get her daughter into the city's top public high school led to her lawsuit challenging the city's use of a racial tiebreaker as one of several factors in deciding whom to admit to oversubscribed high schools. Bros calls herself a mama bear before Sarah Palin used the term. <laughs> And you will discover David Bossy, head of the activist conservative organization Citizens United, a colorful political operative with a controversial past. He wanted to run ads for his highly critical movie about Hillary Clinton. 
but he didn't want to disclose his funding sources and didn't want the law's limits on when he could run the ads during the election or ads for or actually run the movie to apply to him. There also is a security guard named Dick Heller who carried a gun on his job to guard a federal office building in Washington, but because of the city's handgun ban, he could not have a gun in his home, which was in a very dicey area of the city. In all of these cases, very smart, conservative, and libertarian lawyers carefully recruited the most sympathetic clients they could find for their lawsuits. They also strategically picked the courthouses in which to begin their challenges. In Florida, for example, you'll meet then State Attorney General Bill McCollum, who would lead 26 Republican State Attorneys General in the challenge to the new health care law. He looked to a court that was more than 200 miles from his own office instead of a federal courthouse just right down the street to file that lawsuit because the courthouse 200 miles away offered all Republican appointed judges and had a docket with very few criminal cases likely to slow down his health care lawsuit. The four cases revealed deep divides among the justices over racial classifications in the 14th Amendment, including, amazingly, after all these years, a division on the court over the meaning of Brown versus Board of Education. Also, a deep divide over the meaning of the Second Amendment, money in elections and the First Amendment speech protections, and Congress's power to make laws for the public welfare under the Commerce Clause and the Tax and Spend Clause in the Constitution. My book comes out in paperback next month, and I wrote a new chapter focusing on three major decisions from last term, the Shelby County Voting Rights Challenge, the University of Texas Affirmative Action in Admissions case, and Edie Windsor's challenge to the Federal Defense of Marriage Act. The voting rights and affirmative action challenges started much as the other cases in my book. They started with a smart conservative activist and lawyer who recruited the clients, funded the lawsuits, and targeted the Supreme Court. For example, the justices never saw the chief architect of the constitutional challenges to the University of Texas admissions program and to the key provisions of the Voting Rights Act. The very low key man behind both cases, as well as two earlier voting rights cases in the Supreme Court, is not a lawyer. A former stockbroker and Democrat turned Republican, Ed Blum is the founder of the One Man Project for Fair Representation, a conservative nonprofit organization in Virginia that funds challenges to racial and ethnic classifications. I interviewed him in 2006, almost eight years ago, when he was involved in another voting rights case. It was not the one that was decided last term that challenged the law's Section 5, considered the heart of the Voting Rights Act, which requires jurisdictions with a history of vote discrimination to get approval from the Justice Department or a federal court in Washington before making any changes in their voting practices. He told me in 2006, he said, if passed as prologue, Kennedy will be with us as he has been on all of the voting rights cases. I'm hopeful Justice Alito, unlike Justice O'Connor, will side with the conservative majority going forward without waffling on some of the finer points. I have less to go on with Roberts, but my friends who worked with Roberts tell me he should be very solid in this area. Most importantly, America has moved on from the racial issues that confronted society back in the mid 60s. There will be a section five case. Well, Blum was prescient and he was the one who brought last term's section five challenge. He scoured the Justice Department's website almost daily to look for a city or a county 
that had sought approval of some voting change and had been rejected. He found Shelby County, Alabama. He recruited the county for his constitutional challenge, hired a lawyer to file it and argue it, and funded the entire litigation. He used the same modus operandi in last term's affirmative action case as well, and he used the same lawyer. He looked to the internet, gave speeches to conservative youth organizations, and contacted friends in his hunt for a white student who had been rejected for admission to the University of Texas and who had test scores and a record that exceeded the lower admissions criteria that applied to some minority applicants. After more than two years of searching, he found Abigail Fisher, his client, his name plaintiff for the case that went to the Supreme Court and was decided last term. The same type of cause litigation was happening on the liberal side of the spectrum in a challenge to California's ban on same-sex marriage. The American Foundation for Equal Rights, founded in 2009 by Hollywood actor and director Rob Reiner, along with other television and movie producers, was the sole sponsor of the legal challenge to Proposition 8. The organization recruited Ted Olson and David Boies, who were opposing lawyers in the 2000 presidential election case, Bush v. Gore, to bring this new lawsuit on behalf of two gay couples who wished to marry in California. But no one was looking for Edie Windsor in 2009. In fact, when she contacted one national gay rights organization for help, no one returned her calls. Windsor, a retired IBM programmer, had been in a committed relationship with Thea Spire, a psychologist, for more than 40 years, a relationship that they formalized as marriage in Canada in 2007. Spire died in 2009 and left her entire estate to Windsor. Windsor soon faced a federal estate tax bill of $363,053 which she would not have had to pay had she been married to a man. Windsor wanted to do something about what she felt was discrimination. After her call to the National Gay Rights Organization was ignored, she turned to a friend who had helped her and Spire go to Canada to be married. That friend turned to his friend who was a lawyer who then turned to Roberta Kaplan a corporate litigator at a major New York law firm. The day after Kaplan was told about Windsor's plight, she walked over to Windsor's New York City apartment and told Windsor that she would take on the challenge to the definition of marriage in the Federal Defense of Marriage Act. And the rest, as they say, is history and historic. Conservative groups won the voting rights challenge they did not succeed in eliminating race as a factor in the university's admissions policy, but the justices sent the case back to the lower court with directions to apply a tougher type of scrutiny to the university's justification for using race. Liberal groups scored a victory in the same-sex marriage cases. After last term, some commentators and reporters said the term was an example of the Chief Justice playing the, quote, long game, that is, moving incrementally with certain decisions while building up to a major shocker. They pointed in particular to the small steps taken initially by the majority to deregulate money in federal elections, and then the very large step, major step, in Citizens United. And also they pointed to his voting rights decision. He, the court issued a very narrow one in 2009 and then the very major one just last term. However, one justice who you would think might agree with that assessment because that justice is often in dissent from the chief justice in those cases, disagreed with that assessment in an interview with me. In the 2009 voting rights case, where the court basically ducked the question that it decided in Shelby County, this justice said the court was offered 
a narrower alternative to the constitutional ruling and took it. There was no way to avoid the constitutional question in Shelby County. The justice said, and I quote, the court is supposed to react to the cases presented to it. I don't think he, the Chief Justice, has this strategy of taking baby steps. He has a distinct view of the Constitution. I don't think that has changed from when he was in law school. Justice Scalia is the same way. He's just as he was in law school. The October 2012-13 term, last term, solidified, I think, two other characteristics of the Roberts Court. For as long as she is able, Ruth Bader Ginsburg will be the voice of the left when it is in dissent in the term's most important cases. She carried the dissents in the affirmative action, voting rights, two very important job bias cases, and in the term before that, the health care challenge. Everyone agreed, she said, I should write the dissents in the voting rights and health care decisions. It was succeeding to the role of Justice John Paul Stevens. If he had been on the court, he would have written the dissents in both cases. It was not that I preferred myself, but everyone agreed that as the most senior member, I should write them. And she has made clear in multiple interviews that she intends to stay on the court as long as her health, physical and mental, allows and let me tell you, I see no evidence of slippage in <laughs> Justice Ginsburg. I'll also tell you uh, a funny and humbling experience with interviewing Justice Ginsburg for the first time. And I chastise my colleagues for not warning me ahead of time. You will ask Justice Ginsburg a question. And then there is this period of silence. And you sit and you wait. And you want to fill in the silence. You want to give her the answer. <laughs> And then she will come out with this perfect paragraph of an answer, and you will learn so much more than what you thought you were going to learn in asking the question. But for the first time, it is the most nerve-wracking experience. <laughs> and she's like that on the bench in that she's very careful, um, very deliberate in asking her questions. And finally, in terms of characteristics of the Roberts Court, Justice Kennedy maintains the pivotal role on a divided court. He was the only justice in the majority in all three of last term's most important challenges, the affirmative action, voting rights, and defense of marriage cases. So he continues to be the justice who determines how far and how fast the court moves on the issues that divide them most closely. I think you probably would all agree that we are living today in a hyper-partisan time. And I think that presents a difficult challenge for the court in general and the Chief Justice in particular. For the first time in decades, there is a direct correlation between the ideological breakdown of the court's membership and the political party of the appointing president. When they were on the court, John Paul Stevens and David Souter were considered part of the court's liberal wing, but they were Republican appointees. Today, there are five Republican appointees and four Democratic ones, and when they split 5-4, it is often, but not always, but often along ideological lines. A year or so ago, Justice Ginsburg said in an interview, what I care most about, and I think most of my colleagues do, is that we want this institution to maintain the position that it has had in this system where it is not considered a political branch of government. That was something of the risk that the court faced in both the health care and Arizona immigration cases two terms ago. If there had been a clear ideological divide in both decisions, it could have fed a view of the court as making political, not legal, decisions, and it also would have fed the political machine of both parties in the presidential election. I can't remember a time or cases when there was such a forceful effort by outside organizations to get justices recused 
in order to gain an advantage, as we saw with the efforts against Justices Thomas and Kagan in the healthcare cases. There also, I think, is a deep vein of cynicism about the court and how the justices do their jobs. I'm one of those strange people who reads the public comments in the newspaper whenever there is an article about the court, and I've been struck by the hostility and cynicism reflected in those comments, which almost always refer to the decision in Citizens United. So the stakes for the court and its credibility with the American people were very high during the health care term. I do think and I do believe that John Roberts tries whenever possible to find consensus among his colleagues. But I also think he is a very principled judge and he's very confident with strong views of the law in certain areas, race being one of them. He did not achieve consensus in the health care and Arizona immigration decisions, but he did achieve some degree of bipartisanship. He joined with the more liberal justices of the court in upholding the individual mandate to carry insurance. And two justices on the left, Justices Breyer and Kagan, moved to join their conservative colleagues on the Medicaid expansion in the health care law. Those votes actually succeeded in neutralizing the court as a political issue in the presidential campaign. And in just last term, the court's 7-1 ruling in the University of Texas affirmative action case also reflected a successful effort to achieve consensus on how to dispose of that case without ending affirmative action in higher education. Well. Despite that, I'm always asked, isn't the court really practicing politics or is it law? And I think that on the surface is really one of the most profoundly difficult questions to answer. Every justice will deny practicing politics. One justice said to me in the interviews for my book when I raised this, this question, the justice said, well, do I think when I sit down to decide these cases, about what's best for the Republican Party? No. And I don't think Ruth Bader Ginsburg, when she sits down to decide cases, thinks about what's best for the Democratic Party. The results are what they are. A law professor uh, from Loyola University in Chicago did a study based on voting records for 89 justices over a 172 year period she found that just under half of these justices voted with appointees of the other party most of the time. But still, of the last 12 justices, only two, Stevens and Souter, aligned most often with appointees of the other party. Now, she followed that up with a study using regression analysis and more nuanced measures of presidential ideology. The analysis showed ideologies of appointing presidents did not significantly predict justices' votes before the 1970s, but they gained significant predictive power after that. And she wrote that this enhanced success coincided with President Nixon's and Reagan's efforts to prioritize ideology in appointments to the bench. While earlier presidents did not ignore a nominee's ideology. They didn't have the modern technological resources that the later presidents had. By the Reagan administration, the time of the Reagan administration, computerized databases allowed presidential aides to quickly assemble and analyze virtually all of a nominee's past writings. That improved information may have enabled presidents to better anticipate a nominee's future rulings. But still, you know, we come back to whether they are practicing law or politics. And why is it so hard to tell? In my book, I tell about a recent public conversation about civics and the Supreme Court in which just retired Justice David Souter talked about the range of language in the Constitution. He said some language is specific such as the age of eligibility to be president, 35 years old, no debate. Other language, he said, has 
excuse me, extraordinary breadth. For example, unreasonable searches and seizures, even freedom of speech. Those general terms, he said, are best understood as a listing or a menu of approved value, values, the application of which has got to be worked out over time. A great deal of what the Supreme Court does is to attempt to figure out the application of those values. Sometimes the values compete. In Citizens United, he said, the liberty model of free expression says corporations can spend all the money they want independent of candidates. However, an equality approach would say there must be some limitation on corporations so they do not drown out other speech. The Constitution doesn't contain a provision telling the justices how to resolve the tension between those values. Well, then he was asked, how does the public judge the justices? And Justice Souter said, the public has to read the court's decisions. Is that asking too much? He said, a principal decision is one in which the court candidly and convincingly explains why this principle prevailed over that principle. It is the choice of principles that is the tough part. The public judgment has got to be a judgment on whether they believe what the court says, whether they believe what the court says is convincing in making that choice between principles. I think there really are no easy cases in the Supreme Court, or they wouldn't get to the Supreme Court. And as Justice Scalia said to me, there is no relationship between the difficulty of a case and its importance. It could be the most in insignificant case, but it's a bear figuring out the right answer. Now, you've been very patient, and I'd like to leave you with a Supreme Court trivia question. One that I failed miserably but humbly when Chief Justice Roberts quizzed me. My only consolation was that he said no lawyer yet had been able to answer the question. But I'm going to give you the answer just in case you run into him someday and he asks you. There is a small office just off of the Chief's main chambers. He sometimes works there. It is sparsely furnished with a very old desk and uh, a fireplace, also very old, a well-preserved sofa, and a coffee table with two side chairs. The sofa is of the very old-fashioned type. It has a maroon, somewhat hard seat with a very low back. I think it's just, it would be described as a seti. When I met with him, he asked me, to sit on the sofa. And then he told me that was the sofa on which John Quincy Adams died. <laughs> oh, okay, I thought this is a great way to begin. <laughs> he then asked me, do you know why that sofa is now in the Supreme Court? Alas, I had no idea. He said, when most people are asked who was elected president, and also confirmed as a justice of the Supreme Court, they answer William Howard Taft. Good answer, but he wasn't the only person. Now, I embellish this a little bit with my own very studious research from here on out. It seems that Abigail Adams, John Quincy Adams' mother, asked President James Madison to nominate her son to the Supreme Court. And of course, as we have learned from her letters, Abigail Adams was quite persuasive, and Madison complied. John Quincy was nominated and confirmed unanimously to the Supreme Court by the US Senate. But he didn't want to be a Supreme Court justice. He wanted to be president of the United States. The day after his confirmation, he declined to serve. The position eventually went to Joseph Story of Massachusetts, who at age 32 became the youngest person in US history to sit on the high court. John Quincy went on to become president 
And after service in that office, and I have no idea why, he was elected to the House of Representatives. <laughs> On February 21st, 1848, Adams was at his seat in the House chamber when he voted a loud no to a resolution giving thanks to several generals for their service in the Mexican War. A few minutes later, he collapsed. Adams was taken into the rotunda and placed on a sofa from the House Speaker's office. And they put him in front of the east door of the Capitol in the hope that fresh air would revive him. Seeing no improvement, however, Adams and the sofa were next taken into the Speaker's office where Adams died two days later. Now the sofa, like all good furniture that has served its owners well, had to make way for new furniture. And sometime after 1857, it was moved to the Supreme Court, which was at the time located on the ground level of the Capitol building. <coughs> Curiously, a second government official died on that sofa. On January 26, 1899, Attorney General Augustus Garland suffered from apoplexy while arguing before the court and was brought into the clerk's office where he was placed on the Adams sofa. He expired shortly thereafter. <laughs> so now you know the answer if the Chief Justice asks who besides William Howard Taft was elected president and confirmed as a justice of the Supreme Court and why that sofa has its relationship in the Supreme Court. But given its history, don't be too quick to sit on that sofa. Thank you very much.